Thank you very much for inviting me to come to Finland, which I always enjoy doing. And thank you for being here on a Friday afternoon in what is the slot just before the weekend begins. Um, I thought perhaps I should really explain a little bit about why I'm here, because I am not an expert in disability. I am a social worker, but I was asked to come and give an international perspective on some of the issues that you've been discussing in the last two days. And um, yes, I will mention disability as we go along, but actually I want to talk about people. And I want to talk about people because I'm a social worker. And it doesn't matter what the issue is that people are facing the fundamental principles behind how social workers go about doing their business are absolutely critically the same. And I think that I want to just change that focus from slightly from the services that you've all been discussing, which are so essential, but actually to think how they fit into the wider context um, beyond the, the immediate uh, discussion about uh, services for in terms of disability. So, how did I get here? Well, I'm the president of the International Federation of Social Workers, and we have two sister organizations at the international level, the International Council of Social Welfare and the International Association of Schools of Social Work. And the three organizations work together at the UN, we work together with WHO, we work together regionally, and we work together nationally in terms of taking issues from social work and social policy into that global arena and that international level. My own organization covers 120 countries and over 3 million social workers. And if you are a member of Talenthia, you are also a member of IFSW. And I'm not sure how many frontline social workers necessarily realize that they are a member of a huge global organization. But we are. And we have skills, knowledge, and expertise that we should be sharing and be influencing, particularly in the area of social policy. Like President Trump, I have a four-year term, and I can stand for re-election. And I can assure you that that is exactly where the similarity ends, as I hope you will realize as we go through this, um, uh, this discussion. And I want it to be a discussion, I want it to be an, it to be an engagement about what you want from the international scene but also what you, can what you can give to the international scene. Because this is a very much um, a, an area where we are developing all the time. And I don't think, as a profession, we have ever really taken on board the influence we could have in the world to create the aim of the three international organizations, which is sustainable, inclusive, peaceful communities. That's where we want to live. That's where everybody wants to live. And the reality is that we don't have that. But we have the skills to actually help achieve that. And sometimes we think about it in terms of what we can do with individuals or with families or perhaps with communities. But we don't really historically think about what we can do at that national, that international level. Because actually we can use the same skills that we have acquired as social workers in those micro situations and take them to the mezzo and the macro. So I think there's a bit about me being here which is to say Let's take that conversation. Let's take that vision. Let's see where we can go together. 
And one of the things that I always liked about President Obama was he said, we can. And I think one of the big messages from disability that I have taken over the years is we can. And one of the big civil society messages that got through to people was through the Paralympic movement. I think that has done more for changing the concepts about people who happen to have a disability. But actually they're people and they can achieve and we can achieve and we can do things together. And I think that we, if we don't just restrict ourselves to thinking about what we have to do politically, but also what we have to do in terms of civil society, then we have to take a role model, like the achievements of something like the Paralympics, to help us to promote inclusion in our societies. And I think that that's the we can message that I hope that we will end this afternoon on. And I've, uh, there are other images about people where they work and how they work. And I was absolutely delighted to hear on the first morning discussion about the right to employment. And I think that that's an issue that I want to just explore a little bit more in terms of a reflection about the last two days. We talk about services. We've talked about rights. We also have to talk about responsibilities. And you can't be a member of a society without having responsibilities as well as rights. The two go together. And all of us have those rights and responsibilities. So I want us to explore some of those notions about how we achieve that. And I want to take an example from a completely different kind of aspect of social work, which was mentioned to me since I've been here in Finland and was actually the reason why I was here in, in October. Um, because I think that some of the reasons that people are, are in these photographs is because they've got over the hurdles that society put in the place about getting into work, about doing the sports that they want to be involved with. But when I was here in October, I was working with the, another big social issue in Europe. Migration. Displaced people. Paperless people. And I just want to think about the origins of this. I don't know if you can see it at the back. It is a passport. And without a passport or identity paper, you cannot get into many of our social protection systems. And I was reflecting back on, well, when did this hurdle get introduced into all of our societies? And if you look at Wikipedia, you will find that it comes really as a result of the world, First World War. The restriction on the movement of people by paper was introduced just before World War I. And it wasn't properly consolidated until the 1960s in the civil aviation uh, agreements that were made at the UN. This is a very recent hurdle that we have created, people have created, to restrict the movement, to offer social control about who will and who will not live in our countries, but we didn't invent it till relatively recently. Now, there are other hurdles that we have invented, and we need to be critical in our reflection about how they came about and how we're going to get rid of them. And one of the questions that we've been looking at at the International Federation of Social Workers, 120 countries, 
has been the issue about social protection systems. And so what I want to do is think about the context of social protection systems. I want to think about co-production, and I want to think about what is actually the role of social work, and what is actually the role of social policy. And one of the starting points was uh, in, we, in writing a paper that we've just recently adopted as a, a policy paper. From our professional practice experience, we find that people don't want to be in the hands of disempowering social care systems, which undermine communities of their organic means of helping one another. Remember that rights and responsibilities, that mutual respect for each other, that dignity and respect for each other. People who use social services and those trying to access them want fairness. They want social justice, a level playing field, and equal opportunity to succeed. They want their voices to be heard and to have influence over their own lives. They don't want charity. They want to be involved. They want to be in the driving seat. And I want to pose a question, because that's what social workers do. When you talk about choice of services, is that a real choice? Or is it a, a choice which is compromised by, well, actually, these are, this is the only choices you have on offer. If you want to do something else with that money, you cannot do it. And it's a form of that type of social control. So I'm going to go back to the international definition of social work. Practice-based. And it's also an academic discipline. And it influences social policy. It promotes social change and development, social cohesion, and the empowerment and liberation of people. You cannot do social work without also engaging in social policy development. It doesn't make any sense. You just keep the status quo if you do. And that's an interesting point to have a shattered glass. <laughs> Under, in, included also in the international definition, principles of social justice, human rights, collective responsibility, and respect for diversities are central to social work, underpinned by theories, um, sorry, <laughs> underpinned by theories of social work, social sciences, humanities, and indigenous knowledge. Hey ho, social societies worked way before any thought of this profession called social work or this concept called social policy. If you look back to some of the way that some of our indigenous um, communities have kept and, and uh, govern their own societies, there's a huge amount of knowledge out there about how we can create inclusive, peaceful communities. Um, we're not reinventing the wheel. but this is key. Social work engages people and structures to address life challenges and enhance, enhance well-being. And one of the questions that came up yesterday was a, a question about structural social work. Now, that was a new concept to me because I didn't actually understand it. So I've learned something and I'm still struggling with it. But I think it somehow fits in with the fact that we're not just dealing and working with people, we're also working with structures. And sometimes those structures can be abusive. They can be harmful. 
they can prevent people doing uh, and having a good quality of life. So we've got the, the definition of what we do, we've got an aim, and now I want to talk about social protection systems. Because when you're talking about services for disability, you're talking about social part of a social protection system. The ILO um, did a, have done a huge amount of work on social protection system and, and they promote Resolution 202. And their basis for doing so is to say that 73% of the world population have no or very restricted access to social protection, resulting in the perpetuation of extreme poverty and hardship in the lives of the majority of the world's inhabitants. The economists will tell you that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Social workers will tell you that the social protection systems that we are operating at the moment are leaving people out, that we are leaving people under the floorboards, in the shadows, people who cannot access those social protection systems for all sorts of reasons. And some of them are about personal choice. Some people choose not to be part of a social protection system. Some of them are barred because they, are, they don't have the papers or the passport to get there. And yet, we describe it as a human right, enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And all the other international treaties that talk about fundamental rights and social rights and everything else. And the ILO recommendations says that we need to define a minimum level of social protection as a right to social security. However, governments are free in the way they conceive and organize their national social protection systems. So some governments do it well, and some don't really do it at all. And you in Finland, are going through a, a political change, or are, are in the midst of a, a political turnaround, where you have gone from, yes, it has been a right, you've had this social protection system, but now that is contracting, and it is making a difference to the way that people are included within your society. It's happening all over Northern Europe. It is about to happen very strongly in the States. It is happening in, in other countries in the world. And it's a significant problem in, a, in uh, Africa. So we decided we would start to look at this as, uh, as social workers across the world. And we have really looked at the issue about social protection systems. Because we think that the proposal by the ILO is actually flawed. And it's flawed because it keeps the status quo as opposed to being transformational. And it's quite a complicated argument and you really have to think through, well, why would that be? Because social protection should be protecting all of the people. So we started by saying, taking it in two parts. What is it we're looking for in terms of social protection systems. And then, well, what is the role of social workers? Because we work with people and we work with civil society and we work with politicians and therefore that's where we, we, we need to work out what our role is in doing this. And the dilemma that we came across was that the ILO locates social welfare in a context which is too small for us as social workers. We look at it in a broader context and if you start looking at it in a, as a social development model as opposed to a social protection model, 
you will lead to positive economic outcomes to more sustainable, stabilized, resilient, and harmonious societies, which is the aim of the three international organizations. If you go, I, went, I was in China quite recently, and the minister said to me, we cannot have economic health without social health. If you read the book by Angus Deaton on the roots of inequality called The Great Escape, and Angus Deaton was the Nobel Prize winner for economics in 2015, he says the growing problem between the rich and the poor will not be solved by aid or welfare systems. It will be solved by employment. And if you look at India and China, who have the, most, the, the, the biggest growth in uh, in the economy and actually the reduction of poverty, you'll find that it is through employment that they have actually achieved that change. So as social workers, we need to take on board, and as people, we need to take on board, what are the drivers of change and transformational change, because as social workers, what we're trying to get to is a much more equal, and a much more socially just society. Sorry. Current issues. We're, we're, right. And this is, I just wanted to just go in a little bit of detail about what, what the prob problems are at the moment. The provision of social protection has traditionally been seen as alleviating the impacts of insecurity, poor health, economic and social vulnerability, and can help preserve basic standards of living for all. So it preserves the status quo. Social protection reduces fears and gives assurance and confidence that such problems do not result in a further impoverishment. A bit suspect that, because as the rich go richer, the gap gets wider, and the relative poverty gets uh, brought into it. More recent debates have raised the question about whether this traditional perspective feeds a dependency model. And how many times in social work have we talked about dependency models? And what have we come up with in order to change that? Is it possible to construct social protection systems that are socially transformative by reducing inequality and building social justice. I don't know if any of you have seen this film. If you haven't, you should. It's about a social protection system that doesn't work. And it, is, it won the Palme d'Or uh, last year. It's about um, a man who had a heart problem and try to access social security. It is a big problem. What they should do, they should be preventative and have a sustainable effect. They should strengthen resiliency of individuals, families and communities and enhance the capability to react to risks of life. We should be helping each other not relying on systems in terms of how we move things forward. It should be there to provide a better quality of life for vulnerable populations living in precarious situations. But it is how we do that that is the important factor. And we have to recognize that particularly at times of disasters like earthquakes and avalanches, there is a particular need for proper social protection systems. They should promote the realization of basic human rights and make a crucial contribution to establishing social justice. Why? Social protection helps to stabilize economic development as it has been demonstrated that every one dollar spent on social protection yields a three dollar return to the economy. But I'm talking about social protection where people contribute to it and don't just take from it in terms of the, respons the mutual responsibility we have to each other. 
as people become empowered, they become engaged in economic activity, and this leads to increased social and economic outcomes. If you talk to a migrant, there are two issues that face them when they cross borders and come into a strange country. One is the loneliness of their journey, the isolation. The second one is if they go straight into employment, they start contributing. And many of our hurdles in terms of employment and how we bar people from employment actually builds resentment and fear and isolation and exclusion from societies. Yesterday, people began to talk about employment in, for, in terms of, of the issues in, in disability. It's the same in any walk of life. If people are not feeling that they're contributing to the community, they don't feel part of it. So we have to find and um, open our doors in ways of making that kind of um, inclusion in society accessible. It reduces poverty, reduces inequalities, contributes to social co cohesion, and lays a base for socially sustainable economic development. The implications. It's in our code of ethics as social workers that we have to be involved in this. The role of social workers is to mediate between state services and family, family community systems to achieve outcomes that reinforce the capacity of family and community in sustainable self-care and the ability to access social protection systems when necessary. A lot of reviews of social work services across the world where they've had a, a, previously had quite a, a uh, a robust welfare system has been to say we can't afford it. More of the same won't do. You may have heard your own politicians saying statements like that. We have to think about citizen leadership. We have to think about people taking on that responsibility in a different kind of a way. And we have to help people make that kind of change in the way that we run, the way that we do things. Businesses should not be excluding disabled people from working within their systems. And we need to do some, some educating about why that's important. Social workers use their knowledge, experience, and skills to advocate within services to ensure that people who use services are treated with dignity and are able to make decisions with respect to the care that they receive. And, and I think there's a real culture shift that, that we have to be responsible for, both as people who are accessing services, but people who, ought, who are running them, and listening and um, being much more part of an inclusive cooperation. Cooperative. I mean, why do we not have more cooperative services um, rather than these hierarchical systems that we currently are developing in terms of privatization and some of the other services that are going on? So we work in a matrix. There are the people who use the services, there are people who run the services, there are other professionals who influence how services are, are given. When we create a meeting and a discussion about how those services might be run, reflect on whether they are meetings of people who are treated equally and with respect and with dignity. 
I think some of the language that we use, customers, clients, service users, does not portray that equality. The, and I'm not even sure that the current phrase, experts by experience, necessarily covers that. And I think we've got to find a language that actually says co-construction actually requires us not to make just a technical change, but a cultural change in how we go about our business. How many... I was going to ask a question, and I'm just thinking that's actually... Um, when we construct a service, we've talked a lot in the last two days about consultation and involvement and choice. But I, I think what I'm asking you to think about is, is that still retaining an us and them situation. And I want to give an example. When they were interviewing for the chief executive of the Mental Welfare Commission which, in Scotland, which is one equivalent of our ombudsman in mental health, the people who asked the most pertinent question were the people who uh, were on the board who had learning disabilities, or who had had the experience of having been detained um, within mental health systems. They'd lost their liberty. But they were the ones who asked the critical questions. And the decision about who, who, who got that job at the end of the day was actually made by the people who were the experts in the situations that, 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 that this person was going to, to be working with. And I did, and I, but what I was impressed with was the how they did that interview and that presentation, which was on a very equal basis, with the government advisors being next, you know, alongside and working with the, the people who'd had the experience. And, I, and that's transformational. And I'm just wondering, at this point, in Finland, where you are moving from what has been a relatively secure welfare system to something which is now being influenced by right-wing politics and is part of that whole change in the way that we, we, we do things in civil society whether there isn't a bit of a, oh my goodness, that's a step too far. And so I'm posing a question. I don't know the answer to it because I, I've, I've been trying to listen and I've been trying to work out and I don't speak Finnish and I am having a bit of difficulty in, in terms of understanding how far down that route people are. So I'm asking you the question. I don't know the answer. I may be way off beam on that, but I would like you to think about it in terms of what do you really mean in terms of inclusion and involvement and choice and empowerment and are we really at that point where you can confidently or we can confidently say we can, including everybody. And I know it's a hard question for us to ask ourselves because we think we're pretty good at doing social work and we're pretty inclusive. But I'm actually asking, are we really? And I think that co-production requires us to listen and it requires us to allow 
and to permit conversations to happen that we might feel very uncomfortable about. And if we don't do that as a social work profession, we're not doing our job. It's, it's a difficult one to get your head around, but otherwise we are just per perpetuating the, the status quo. And one of the big problems we have in implementing all of this is how do we engage employers in that debate. I had a conversation at lunchtime with somebody about middle managers. And the problem about middle management is that you're no longer a practitioner and you're, no long, and you, and you're not yet a boss. And so you're caught in between the two. And our hierarchical structures that we have developed provide a level at which social control becomes more um, prominent than actually enabling people to be included in the decision making and in the way forward that they want to be. And I think we've got a bit of a problem in social work and social policy about the dialogue that we have and the discussions we have with management at both middle med level and at higher management level and with the political sphere. Um, and it's sometimes quite a difficult conversation to have but I do believe that we have to have it. So what I'm trying to say, and I'm not sure whether I've said it very well at this point, but that we need to look broader than looking at just what services are about. We need to look broader at the place that people being involved in society are, if they are involved and they're working and they're in a transformative um, kind of way of being much more included in society, actually you get your sustainable communities, your harmonious societies. You get people who are happier. But it's a dual responsibility. It's a rights and responsibility for both um, the experts by experience and for the professionals and for the politicians and for civil society and for the media. And if we are not coordinate, contributing to that dialogue and to that discussion, we will not be able to create the communities that we want, which are these peaceful, harmonious, supportive communities. Sometimes as social workers, we tend to kind of think we can do it all, and we can't. We've got to work with other people. And sometimes society likes to think we can do it all. It's not just a, a one-way process. Sometimes society would prefer to have that group of social workers over there go and sort out the mess over there, and please, we don't really want to have very much to do with that because that's really not very nice kind of stuff to get involved with. No, it's all our responsibility. And, and we've got to, to have that dialogue. So I want to take the conversation on a bit from where it was yesterday by saying, yes, we do need to be involved politically. Yes, we do need to be involved in civil society. Yes, we do need to be involved with the media. But we need to have a vision of where we're going and what we want to do. And you can see more about the... the background and, and, and the proper paper on, on the social protection system from the details I've put on there. But at, at the local level, you have conferences where you get together like you do here. And then at European level, you have meetings and so on at, um, Euro, uh, at the Council of Europe and at the uh, Parliament in, in, uh, in Europe of which some of us may not be members for, for too long, much longer. Um, but at the international level, we also have these organizations that are working together. And my big challenge now to you and to us is 
We've got the schools of social work. We've got the International Council of Social Work Welfare. That's many NGOs. Practitioners. For me, there's one missing. What's the one that's missing? The experts by experience. The people who use the services. We have no equivalent organization at the international level. There are some at European level, but they tend to be in kind of mental health or about accessibility or they tend to be about something else. So they're kind of silo organizations in a sense. Whereas we're about communities and a much broader matrix of the issues that we're talking about. So the transformation that I'm talking about is we need to have, think beyond the issue of just disability or just migration or just child protection or just criminal justice. We need to think about society and we need to have that bigger picture. And these three organizations, and I want to see the fourth one, and I'm, we're working at the moment to help make links with various organizations across the world to get that fourth organization there um, by 2018 in Dublin. But we come together in a global agenda, yeah, which is about sustainable co communities. It cannot be achieved without the involvement. The involvement, not the choice, but the involvement of people who are experts by experience. I'm just going to finish very quickly and say, you've got three issues there that we, we want to see further involvement with. World Social Work Day on the 21st of, of March. What are you going to do in Finland to say, this is our new social work, this is what we're really about. And in Dublin in 2017, I'm hoping that that fourth organization will make its debut. That will be the community which is going to contribute to transformational change. I'm sorry, I went on too long. There we are. So how do we work together for transformational change is the question. Thank you, Ruth.